Good afternoon, everyone. If we can go ahead and get seated so we can get started. Oh, I didn't mean to silence the crowd like that. I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll wait for the last folks to get in and find a seat. Alrighty, so let's get started. So y'all ready to get ready to stay woke? You ready? Okay. I'm I'm trying to stay woke after last night, so um, <laughs> I apologize in advance. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stacy Cleveland. I'm the senior managing director here at Teach for America for the African American Community Initiative. Um, welcome to our session today. It really has been a pleasure uh, planning this session. We've been in the planning phases for several months and it's wonderful to see it finally come alive. I do want to recognize my colleague Patricia Leon Guerrero who is going to be coming in a little late because she's working hard at another session this morning but we planned this together. Uh, so really excited for this conversation, really excited for this um, dynamic and interesting panel we have here today. Uh, as you guys know, the, the African American Community Initiative and the Latino Community Initiative, we work in conjunction with one another because Trish and I really believe in our communities. We believe in our respective communities and we know that we can get to the next level in this work if we work in collaboration and we, and we are intersectional in this work. Um, we act diligently to expand life opportunities for both black and brown boys in our classrooms and in our communities. And we've worked really hard to make sure that this is a session that we can kind of keep real, as you can see from the title. Hashtag stay woke. I, you, you can't get any more real than that. Um, so we wanted to make sure that this was really a conversation for you all to engage and ask questions. We'll have a little time for that, but definitely hear from this expert panel um, on this topic. And they have really opened my eyes to this subject, and I'm really looking forward to them opening your eyes as well as the audience. We have a really wonderful agenda for you today. We have two amazing core members who are going to give their reflections from the classroom. We have two outstanding students from the DC um, area, st high school students from the DC area who are also going to give their reflections. So we have a lot coming for you today. Yes, David. We have a lot coming for you today. So I am extremely honored to inter introduce our two core members. Um, one core member will open our session, and then our second core member will actually help close out the session. So our first core member is Mario Benabi. He's a 2014 New York City core member. So shout out to New York City. Like I said, he will be closing out our uh, session today. He is currently working as a special education mathematics specialist. Shout out for Special Education Diverse Learners Initiative. That's a little plug for them. Um, at the Bronx River High School. He is a graduate of John Jay College of Criminal Justice, where his study of focus was cross-disciplinary learning in culture and deviant studies, sociology, and Latin American studies. I'll snap for that one. Mario is also the initiator of Do the Right Thing Pedagogy and Hip Hop Education for Special Education Classrooms. I would love to sit in on that. He recently founded an action and advocacy organization called Empower Ed, which focuses on education policy. Mario, we definitely look forward to hearing from you at the close of our session. But to get us started, I'm really pleased to introduce Mr. Patrick Harris. Patrick is a 2015 DC core member, shout out to DC. Patrick has a near dear place to my heart. I met him a couple years ago in Detroit during our Black Leaders and Achievers Caucus Conference and every time I call, he's like, Stacey, I can't say no to you. So I'm like, okay, well, I'll keep calling until you say no. Um, <laughs> Patrick is currently a second grade teacher at Achievement Prep Academy here in DC. 
He hails from Southfield, Michigan. Patrick is a first generation college student and proud graduate of Michigan State University's elementary education program. As a first year teacher, Patrick really has realized his lifelong dream of becoming an educator. Patrick integrates social justice and radically cultural, culturally responsive practices into his classroom. In addition to teaching, Patrick also travels the country facilitating deployment readiness curriculum for children of active duty soldiers. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Patrick Harris. Good afternoon. I'd like to start off just by reading two quick letters that my students wrote. Dear teachers in Detroit, we have been learning about the protests in Detroit. And by watching the protests, it made me feel mad and sad because the government is not doing their job. We are going to, it makes me feel happy because they said that they were going to fix the schools. And I'm so sorry for you and your students because you have to go through this. I hope the mayor fixes the schools. Dear teachers in Detroit, enough is enough. I feel bad for what you are going through right now and it is unfair. We need the government to do their job now. What a time to be alive. In fact, what a time to be woke. My name is Patrick and I teach 22 second graders in Southeast DC. All of them are students of color. 16 of them are beautiful, carefree, black and brown boys who despite their charm and playfulness could be slain in the streets by the power that be simply because of the color of their skin, what clothes they wear, or the music they choose to listen to. This realization directly impacts the way in which I interact with my students. For me as a black man, a first generation college student, being a black male teacher teaching black and brown boys is personal. And I am always in a constant state of reflection. I have the responsibility to pass to my students the tools of liberation. Literacy, numeracy, and writings are not just merely tools for assessment, However, they are keys to being able to fight a liberated life. As educators, who we are and how we think about black and brown boys has a direct impact on how and what we teach them, how we discipline them, and ultimately how they view the world. I can barely describe the overwhelming emotion that comes when you're a black teacher and you're looking into the eyes of your black and brown boys after you just finished scrolling through your Twitter feed and you've seen that there's no indictment. You've seen another black body has been left out in the streets. And there were just some times where I just emotionally could not take seeing another black body and another black life not matter. But you know what, I teach anyway. And as soon as I get control of myself, I start to realize that my students could be next, but also so could I. I believe that we as black men in public education bring each day to our classroom the ever-present awareness that each day for our student is life or death, just as it is ours. We have the responsibility to focus on refining our own and teaching our children a racial literacy, a literacy of resistance and resilience an ability to understand and navigate our country's racial justice landscape. I began this speech by reading two letters from my students who they wrote to the Detroit Federation of Teachers and because we just concluded our unit on friendly letters. And at the same time, we were reading the sick outs uh, happening in Detroit because of, the de because of the deplorable school conditions. One of the things I appreciate most about my students is that they allow me to be my authentic self in the classroom. They allow me to bring my strengths, my weaknesses, my hurts, my pains, and they greet me with nothing but acceptance and love. I call Detroit home. So the conditions of Detroit public schools hurt, and my students felt that. I challenge my students to see injustice exactly where it lives, 
in their own backyard. I challenge them and tell them that injustice faces people and kids who look exactly like them. And after we acknowledge this injustice, we empathize with it and we realize that we too can play a small role in ending this. Action is what shapes a generation of leaders. My students must grow up woke. So think about that. The way our education system is set up, we adults have the power to change trajectories of our students. But I thought to myself, what does this say about us as adults and what we think about black and brown boys if we don't include them in designing their own educational experience? As educators, as school leaders, as adults, we are in positions of power and we have to be in a constant state of reflection. How we view black and brown boys has a direct impact on their education. We have to do a better job remembering that students have a voice and they deserve to exercise it. They don't need no nonsense nurturing, they just need straight up nurturing. We should not be describing black boy brilliance as nonsense because that within itself is nonsense. And by showing them nurturance, I guarantee you that they're gonna give it right back to you. Quick example, one of my students was running down the hallway early in the morning and I said, Tristan, why are you running? And I noticed that he had two breakfast boxes that he got from the cafeteria. And I said, dang, you must have been hungry. He said, uh, yeah, yeah. And I said, how did, how did you get two? He said, don't worry about it. I said, <laughs> all right, Tristan. And then he dropped one of the lunch boxes on my desk and I said, what? And he said, well, Mr. Harris, you told me you forget to eat in the morning. And it took everything out of me not to cry, just like I am right now. But it lets me know that black boys don't want to be controlled. They want to be loved. They want to be coached. They want to be hugged. They want you to model the way for them. They want you to allow them to teach you, know, you something. So let's give them that. Sharing with these black and brown boys the tools to resist and to promote change is personal for me. It's a responsibility. There is no better time than now. I do what I do because for me, there is no other option. And I always think to myself, now is the time. What a time to be alive. Thank you. <laughs> now you see why I love Patrick. Thank you so much, Patrick, for your dedication and commitment to your classroom and to this uh, cause. So it is now my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Dr. Andre Perry. Andre is an education leader, author, and advisor to people working to improve education in K through 12 and post-secondary institutions. Dr. Perry established a groundbreaking new college of urban education at Davenport University to prepare and enable teachers and administrators to teach and lead effectively in urban school districts. Prior to this, he served as CEO of the Capital One University of New Orleans Charter Network. Andre is a native of Pittsburgh and earned his PhD Pittsburgh, earned his PhD in education policy and leadership from the University of Maryland College Park. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Andre Perry, or as he recently informed me, Dre Love. <laughs> Thanks, stay, say, stay woke. No, 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 say, stay woke. Let's talk about a culture of violence. The late great civil rights leader, Julian Bond once said, violence is black children going to school for 12 years and receiving six years worth of education. I can't think of a better quote to frame this Teach for America 25th anniversary session, stay woke, stop the violence, increase the opportunity, hopefully you're in the right place. Bond reminds us that bad public policy has stolen more years from young lives than gun violence ever will. 
Being woke means being aware of what's going on in your community. Staying woke on issues of violence requires a constant checking of the mindset of victim blaming. The problem with our passion to end a culture of violence is that it comes from the same place as the appetite to indict brown and black people with charges of self-destruction. The tradition of blaming black folk keeps us from aiming at real sources of violence. If we were really interested in ending violence, we would be asking who pulled the trigger to underfund schools in Philadelphia? Who poisoned our brothers and sisters in Flint, Michigan? Who and what made New Orleans the incarceration capital of the world? More importantly, we would teach our students to raise these questions. Say, stay woke. Stay woke. So let's get woke to what violence really is. Violence is having a school resource officer from Spring Valley High School flip a child out of a desk for allegedly for improper cell phone use. Really, if teachers treated students like future colleagues, we, would, we wouldn't be in that situation. To get to its source, we need to ask why our youth are responding to violence beyond the armchair retort, it all starts at home. Seriously, stop blaming parents for underachieving kids. And saying that it, not all kids go, can go to college is just a euphemism for black and brown kids aren't smart enough. These insidious forms of violence demonstrates that root causes are ignored because black and brown worth is devalued. So let's get to some serious solutions from some serious panelists who can get us woke, help us stay woke on this issue. I'm gonna ask each panelist to raise their hand um, as they are called. Dr. D I mean, D David Johns the ex is the executive director of the White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for African Americans. The initiative works across across federal agencies with partners and communities nationwide to produce a more effective continuum of education programs for African American students. Prior to joining the department, Johns was a senior education policy advisor to the Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, Pensions under the leadership of Senator uh, Tom Harkin. We also, we also follow his fierce advocacy through the hashtag Teach the Babies. Put your hands together. For, Do for David Johns. Oh, sorry. Dr. Roy Jones is the executive director for the Eugene T. Moore School of, Education, of Education's Call Me Mr. program and professor in the Department of Educational Leadership at Clemson University. The mission of Call Me Mister is to increase the pool of quality teachers from diverse backgrounds to serve in the nation's lowest performing elementary schools. Dr. Jones leads the most recognized post-secondary collaborative in the nation for recruiting, retaining, developing leadership, and producing fully certified African-American male elementary and middle school teachers, um, uh, level teachers. Please welcome Roy Jones. Marco Davis is Deputy Director of the White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for Hispanics. The initiative seeks to increase opportunities and improve outcomes in education for Hispanics of all ages and build partnerships with key stakeholders and local communities throughout the nation. In this role, he engages the Hispanic community on the President's My Brother's Keeper Initiative. Prior to the initiative, Mr. Davis was Director of Public Engagement for the Corporation for National and Community Service. Please welcome Marco Davis. And Dr. Ref Rodriguez is, a, is proud to represent the diverse communities as a member of the Los Angeles Unified School District Board of Education in District 5. He is also co-founder of Partnership to Uplift Communities, a network of charter schools serving students in Los Angeles. Ref's 
original inspiration for starting a charter school was to offer high quality learning experiences for youth in the predominantly Latino working class community where he grew up. Please welcome Ref. <laughs> Audience, please join us in the discussion on Twitter using hashtag stay woke and TF25 space permitting. We're gonna get right into it. You know, as I mentioned, there's lots of forms of violence, some insidious, some explicit. In um, one of those forms is violent, of violence, and if we should know anything over the last year, is that certain voices aren't present in discussions of, of this magnitude. I'm gonna ask the panel, what is the role of, um, how should we address gender and sexism in its most insidious forms when discussing violence, and I'm gonna to point to David Johns because this issue really came about in the discussion and planning of this event. Um, so, um, I know some of y'all are trying to stay woke, uh, but I've been up for quite a bit of time uh, thinking about this conversation in particular. And so there are four things that come to mind. Um, the president, the first lady, um, and the secretary of education frequently say, um, and I will add that violence uh, is living in a country where a child's access to opportunity is predicted by code, zip code or genetic code, right? Um, violence is acknowledging that there are babies who wake up every single day, not a single one of them has to be here, but they go through life questioning whether or not there will be an adult who will be there to support them as they make their way through life and invariably fall in the ways in which we all do. Uh, violence is debating whether or not black lives matter when the suicide rate among black boys has doubled between 1993 and 2012. Violence is the hypocrisy of highlighting the importance of the authenticity of youth voice and then having a panel where there is not a single student represented. And so because I said to some of you at the collective gathering in St. Louis, do not invite me back to talk to TFA if there are not students who can speak for themselves, I'm gonna correct that. So Azania and Remy, come join us. Because while it's nice that we read letters from them and serve as proxies for their experience, what I know most of us know is that they can speak for themselves. Yeah. So out of that discussion around gender, we noticed that there were several voices missing. So clearly we wanted women and girls present and, and at least we have uh, one representative um, in the midst. So I'm actually gonna throw this to um, the panelists, the other panelists. How does violence show up? Because, you know, when we see violence in the classroom, that's actually a very human response to the conditions that black and brown people see in their neighborhoods every single day. So tell, tell us how does that show up? And then I'm gonna go ask, how should teachers respond to those very downstream levels of violence? Dr. Jones. Thank you, sir. Uh, when I was listening to Patrick and Andre, um, I was thinking when Patrick was talking about Detroit, um, how it sounded like the Mississippi Delta and the court of shame in uh, South Carolina. When we were talking about those deficiencies in our system, we often in the past talked about the Deep South. Um, now we're talking about Michigan. Um, Malcolm X used to talk about the South being from the Canadian border down. Um, it still is. I want to know, is there any core members out there from the Deep South? I want to hear, are they in the South? Absolutely. All right. Outstanding. This is Black History Month. It's Black History Month. In the spirit of Black History Month, I'm going to give you a quick history lesson. And in honor of Carter G. Woodson, whose house and museum is just down the street, I need to bring to bear 
um, and remember Brown versus Board of Education to talk an answer to this question. See, pre-Brown, pre pre-1954, black children, all black children, especially in the South, were, block, were taught by black teachers and led by black principals. After Brown in 54, and not really beginning until the early 70s, our children were being taught increasingly by white teachers, namely and more increasingly white women. To this day, most of our children in the South are being taught by white teachers. In South Carolina, it remains the same. Yet, when you look at the performance of our children today, post-Brown, even in the best of our schools, our black children, especially boys, are being marginalized and underperforming in those schools. And increasingly, due to a recent study where boys were leading in suspensions and expulsions, our girls, black girls, are the category that is now leading in the most suspended and expelled in our schools. So even among our best schools, when we look at the data, the assessment data, it's interesting that assessment starts with a, the letters ASS, <laughs> that makes us ASSs out of most of us, because we're, we're, we're over assessing our children. We give more assessment in South Carolina than probably any state in the country, and yet we're underperforming in those categories. So something's wrong with that picture. So we're looking at the fact that there's so few, a, a decreasing number over time, historically, of African American teachers, brown and black teachers, in our, in our system, in an increasing number of white teachers. Now, it doesn't mean that just num because numerically, you know, we increase the number, that it changes the outcome. We're talking about having effective pedagogy, effective approaches, like Patrick re represented earlier, where we're trying to connect and build the relationships with children the way they should be. So we're really talking in, 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 the, in the policies of, of, of uh, zero tolerance that was supposed to be designed to protect uh, and, uh, and create learning, safe learning environments are really policies that turned into an adverse effect on black and brown children. We're still the most um, uh, suspended, expelled, and referred for discipline and kicked out of you know, school uh, due to zero so tolerance I want, policies. I actually want to, I'm going to, we're going to get to that later, but I actually want the students to respond to the importance of black and brown teachers. Um, please speak to that need because the data is clear on that importance, but I really want to hear from a qualitative personal standpoint, what does it mean to you to see one, someone who looks like you in the classroom? Yes, Hi. Yes. Hi, I'm Azania Inman. I am a senior at Cesar Chavez PCS in Capitol Hill. Mm -hmm. um, it's not always going to be about race in the classroom and who is teaching you, but it does play a role in kind of role models that we have because oftentimes there is not a lack of white teachers and role models that are um, Caucasian in our society. And we, but there is a lack of often like good, wholesome, strong, powerful African-American leaders in our community. And when we have teachers that are of the same skin color of us, it's kind of like you think they made it out or they're excelling in this in their jobs and they have become kind of a um, they have become something more than what people expected of them and despite all of the trials and tribulations that I'm sure they've had they've kind of they've made it through and that gives us a, a sort of confidence to want to do better and kind of push ourselves so we can also get out or also do better and become a valuable member of society and also become something that we would be proud of. I, yeah, so. Rem 
Remy, you want to you wanna add to that? I'm sorry. I'm nervous. Take me home. Really nervous. You know. Yeah. That's all right. That's all right. What it means to have black people to teach other black individuals is you learn more about where you come from. Yes. Yesterday, one of my teachers who's African American told another, a fellow colleague of his that I was the most, I was the only black person in my class of quarter one and quarter two to actually fully understand what black people went through during slavery. So basically, I am, I am a protege of my fellow blacks. So what that means is that just because I sit in a school that is predominantly Hispanic or predominantly owned by white people doesn't mean that I have that option to turn out to be someone who, how would I put this? Um, someone who used to slay another race. But it means that from that slaying, new shall rise. And we are that new generation to come each and every time there is a new black child born on this world. So what I'm saying is, even though there are teachers in every other state, I think black teachers in every state, I think they're the capital, the nation's capital, should have the most black teachers because we used to be called Chocolate City. <laughs> and ain't nothing like Chocolate City when there's chocolate people in it. You know, let's talk a little bit about where we come from. You know, violence is also when a presidential candidate can grossly proclaim that Mexicans are bringing drugs and crime while branding our brown brothers as rapists, you know, violence is that warped logic of believing, believing that all Latinos are immigrants when in fact everyone in the United States except for Native Americans got here through immigration, right? And, and not all immigration was voluntary. I would like you to remember that. You know, remember this phrase, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. So I I'm really, I'm really want to, for, um, um, for our panelists, Mark or not, and Ref, to, to respond to this. This bifurcated sort of language of black and white in the context of race and the class. Talk about um, what we need to know about Hispanics and Latinos in the classroom because some of the same issues that are, that are plaguing black communities are, are, are hurting Hispanic and Latino communities. So speak on that for us. So I'll, uh, I'll take a stab at starting first. You know, um, there are facts about the Latino population, population in the United States that far too few people know. Um, just some basic facts, right? Before you get into culture, contributions, history, heritage, um, there are basic facts that people don't seem to understand or they refuse to recognize. Uh, Latino students are now one, almost one out of every four students in K-12 in America today. The Latino population is 55 million folks. Repeat that. The Latino population in the United States is 55 million people. Hashtag stay woke. That's right. <laughs> stay woke. And growing. And growing. And like you said, contrary to popular myth, that population growth is going to continue from births right here in the United States. It's not coming from immigration. So the short of that is, for starters, we are here, we've been here, and we ain't going anywhere. <laughs> Stay woke. Exactly. Now, Now, to your question, to your original question, one of the things I would say, one of the dimensions it takes for Latino students that I think it's important for teachers to, to know, and, and I think 
many of you all here already know this, but we need to share this message, is that violence shows up for the Latino community in addition to the explicit violence as we've discussed, it also shows up when humanity is denied. For too many students, whether they're in the Southwest or in big cities like New York and Chicago, where they're nearly half of the student population, so much more than one or a quarter, or in unexpected places that have, uh, uh, that have received significant growth in the number of Latino students in recent years. We're talking about places like Utah and Arkansas and Tennessee that are now grappling with significant mm. growth in the number of Latino students in their schools. One of the problems is that based on what folks see in the media, based on what folks hear is being said in the news, students can get the impression that somehow either they and their families and their histories is either invisible or is purely negative. And that sinks in deep. That tells them that they are not just other. That tells them that they are not just less than. That tells them that they are not, somehow not just somehow illegitimate and unwelcome. It tells them that they are less than human. And that's a basic, basic problem that we have to start overcoming. What we need to do, and again, what I think, thankfully, many teachers in this core and teachers all over the country need to do, but we need more to do, is to see these students, to see these young people for who they are, to tell them that they are loved, to tell them that they are cared for, to help them learn more about their history and their heritage and their culture, to help them realize the contributions that not only have they made to world history, but to American history over the last few years, right? Those are ways you start to overcome these pieces so that they build up that sense of self. They're able to grasp not just who they are, but who they can become. And connecting it back, connecting the dots back, Having more teachers of color in the classroom helps them to realize what is possible. There's a phrase I've heard from many wise people, which is that it's very, very hard to aspire to be what you can't see. Mm, absolutely. Right? And so the truth is that that is the kind of support that we need. And the other thing I want to add about this while I have the mic is, very briefly though, is that it's also important to realize that there is another benefit of having more diversity in the classroom, which is why we work so hard to try and recruit more people of color to go into the teaching profession, because that has a positive impact on the white students in the classroom too. Absolutely. Right? And we need to recognize that there is research and data that shows that seeing a person of color as an authority figure, as a leader, as a role model, not only benefits and has a positive impact on the students of color who are able to see themselves in those roles, but it also affects the relationship that the white students have with adults of color that they will continue to take with them for the rest of their lives. I want to add... Oh. Let okay. I, I want to add uh, to what Marco said and acknowledge that diversity uh, among students not only benefits students, it also benefits adults. So, hey, white people. Hey. Um, sometimes we have this conversation and it becomes overly simplistic, right? And we talk about things as if they're literally black or white, acknowledging that y'all are in these classrooms. What we need to be talking about is having caring and concerned adults who are courageous enough to do things that are uncomfortable, yeah. right? So let's be clear. I've heard some of the most hurtful things said to black kids come out of the mouths of people who look like them. And I've also seen white people show up and conspire and love our babies in ways that we know they need to be loved. Absolutely. Right? So in order to actualize some of the things that Marco talked about and both of our initiatives work to accomplish, we also have to be courageous enough to stand in the gap and to name things. Right? So Marco didn't do this, but I think it's really important. It's to honor that when we have conversations about African Americans and Latinos, some of us exist in the margins. Right? There are Afro-Latinos and people who show up in both spaces. Yeah. Right? You. I know somebody on Twitter was asking why there's no native representation. At some point, somebody's going to say, why is there nobody that's gay? We have to get out of the habit of assuming that people don't have multiple identities. Right? Don't move through spaces encountering the things that our babies encounter as well. And so it's important for all of us to be able to name the things that we know sometimes make people uncomfortable. Right? And to be able to move us all to a space where all of our babies can see themselves reflected in us no matter how we show up. Say, stay woke. Ooh, Ref, speak on that. Speak on, uh, speak on what David just talked about and um, 
complicate these issues that we're, we're um, discussing today? Well, you know, for me, it's, um, we think about policy and we think about Los Angeles, so we think about the numbers of Latinos. Mm. I'm just gonna tell you that um, we just went through a superintendent search in Los Angeles, and two things really stuck out at me. One was the, num the few number of women that were applicants in the pool and the few number of Latinos. Um, so one of the things about being, having those kinds of numbers and yet still feeling marginalized comes from what I believe is what we're doing in our schools, which is assimilating and acculturating rather than liberating, right, and emancipating, right? So we, we do have a system that asks our Latino kids to try to become the middle class. I won't even say white, I'll just say the middle class, something there, out there. To, we talk to them about leaving their communities where the violence exists. I talk about staying in your community, going deep, uplifting it, right? Um, and so we need to make sure that our classrooms and our schools not only have the individuals who, who look like our kids, but these are individuals who are also inspiring our kids to stay in their communities, not to say, I made it, you can make it too. It's like, I made it and I'm still here because I need to make sure I help lift up others in this community. And so we've got to really change the language, the paradigm, and I do agree that sometimes we are our own worst enemies. I keep talking about this piece of getting invited to the table, and I said it five years ago at the TFA 20. Um, why do we keep wanting to be asked and invited to the table when we should start our own table and then Ooh. ask people whether they should be invited to ours, right? So thinking about this completely differently. You know, you know, we are assets, and we have assets in the community. And I say this all the time, there's nothing wrong with black and brown people that ending racism can't solve. We've got to take on th this, this idea that we have skills, we have talent, we should be running our own schools. And it's ridiculous every time a superintendency comes up. And it's the same male pool. When you look in this room, and no disrespect to my brothers and sisters, my brothers here, but the room is filled with talented sisters who are getting it done. So I want to also ask the students, I'm going back to the students. Do you want to be a teacher? You know, this point blank. Because I see a lot of, I mean, I see a lot of great people here, but I, I, do you want to be a teacher? Um, <laughs> the answer is yes. So the question <laughs> is, do I want to be a teacher? No offense to all the teachers in, in the room right now, but no. Because I don't want to sit in the classroom with X amount of students for an entire day. And yeah, it's going to get boring. But <laughs> wait. Wait, wait, with me teaching? Oh yeah, it's gonna get boring really quickly. Um, but all, all these smiles on you guys' faces because there's young people up here with people, except for David Jones, who I've never, I've never met or places I've never been, it makes me want to go out and show young kids that there are people out here that care for you. There are people out here that are willing to break their spines to help you attempt to reach maximum altitude. Yeah. I, don't, I don't do spoken word, but, but, but um, I want to be a forensic scientist. And then when you get tired, you'll teach forensic science. Maybe not. Um, and then I want to have my own kids and show them that their father was this or their father wasn't what people put a lid on and said, you are in this and not in this. No, I want to be in all of it. I dabble in everything. I, as they just said, people of different skin colors are hidden behind stuff. I am not bilingual. Um, I would say trilingual because I'm trying to learn. I'm learning. Um, I'm learning multiple different languages at the same time. Um, the first language I learned was Spanish. Yo soy Puerto Rican. Yo soy Negro. 
I am Puerto Rican, I am black. I stand up for everybody, no matter what. At school, I'm called the bridge. Because, mm. Hashtag stay woke. <laughs> stay woke. Because I speak multiple different languages. I'm able to understand people so that they can understand me and where I'm coming from. Now, no offense, but the white people out there, y'all had, y'all, some of y'all were fed in with silver and golden spoons. Black people, we had to make our own spoons with tin for you, this, that, and the third. We had to push forward. And y'all sailed across with us. And now people are saying that Hispanics shouldn't be here. Black shouldn't be here either because we were bought here by white people. And white people don't understand that once it's gone, it's gone. Y'all can't control what y'all unleashed. What is unleashed is unleashed. Let it be, let it go. Let the baby be brave. No. Before, so Remy, I need you to hear me when I say this. My, my, uh, my. A child's first and most important educator are his or her parents, right? right? Yeah. And we're gonna still work on this because both of y'all don't already recognize that you're educators. You That's teach right. your classmates and you teach each other. Right. Now I think this is really important because we laughed as a group when Andre asked them the question, assuming that the answer was going to be no. Mm. <clears throat> and if we, a room of educators, don't expect that every time a child is asked what you want to be when you grow up, they don't say us, then we are failing at our jobs. Absolutely. It is a problem that we don't expect for them to say yes. I want to be just like you. If, 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 what the hell are we doing? Exactly, exactly. No, I'm not, don't clap and don't laugh. It makes me mad. Excuse me. That these babies sometimes don't understand their brilliance or recognize that they can show up in the way that you do to unlock all that he's able to do in this space. We have to do better. It, it's not that. No, brother, I want you No, 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 that no, wasn't that was it. But I want to add on to what you were saying. Um, so, as he said, we are teachers, but in our own little way. So you guys did not have to choose this career at all. You guys were moved by this career because you wanted to show, see the generations after you grow up and be better. Am I right? Yeah. Um, so what I want to do with my career, what I want to do is I don't want to see nobody do better. I want to bring that toll of death down because of people like me who are up here, who are young, black, and educated, up here speaking in front of... God. Yeah. Oh, 1,200 1, people. 1, Don't worry about it. You didn't know that? <laughs> uh, I meant 10. No. It's just 10 people. Just think okay. 10 people. That's so, all it is. I, when I was younger, um, my mother is a teacher. So um, I've always seen what it is to be a teacher behind the scenes. I know how many papers you have to grade because I, I helped her grade them. <laughs> and I know how frustrating it can be for you all to be in the classroom with sometimes very disrespectful children and also sometimes just kids that think that it's pointless to be in school. And it really does start from within the home. It has to start from your parents teaching you and showing you that educating others is a gift that you should pass on. And I am not planning on becoming a teacher in the traditional sense, but I do want to educate those in my community. Mm -hmm. Hashtag get woke. Y'all ain't tweeting these gems. So, <laughs> I'll be like, go so, ahead, go, sorry. Um, so, and it's also about creating a certain environment in the classroom. Um, it's, it is hard to be a teacher and I understand that. And it is sometimes hard to connect with your students, but the more you connect with your students, the more they will want to be there and appreciate getting an education, because not everyone is allowed to have an education.
So. Now, I want to, um, we, ha we have got, I want um, Dr. Jones to respond to what you're doing in your curriculum to, to, to um, teach teachers, future educators, to um, make them want to reproduce themselves um, in the classroom. But we have really only room for two very, very good questions. So <laughs> if you have a, a great question, please, we have two mics. Um, we're going to take them. They have to be very robust, omnibus, <laughs> robust questions. But <laughs> yeah. Dr. Jones, you know, what are you doing? What's different about your program that will compel teachers to have that kind of um, ethic to want to create future teachers? Yeah, I'm always compelled when, I, when young people speak their heart, um, as these two have done. Uh, one of the reasons why they have the options um, that they're considering is because of uh, teachers um, that they've been exposed to. They're not only their parents, but they're, they're, they're formal teachers. There was a time that own black folk can only be teachers and preachers coming out of the South. Those are the only options we had, teach and preach, uh, especially at HBCUs. Um, what we've done is this, the formal classroom, the formal program is not sufficient. I come out of a, and I, I'm involved in our programs, and call me Mr., are involved in traditional teacher education programs. And I can tell you that for the most part, they don't produce the kind of teachers that can address the needs of these two young folks, for the most part. So we had to do something different. Not only did we have to have our, 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 our misters meet the mandated requirements and qualifications of those programs, but we also had to teach on the side. Some call it the hidden curriculum. We call it the co-curriculum. So along with their four years of education in the teacher education programs, we expose them to the, the part of the curriculum that they weren't getting in their formal classrooms. You know, I'm at Clemson University. Clemson University is a land-grant institution that was founded, you know, with a policy that kept black and, blacks and women out of the university. It was a policy of segregation. You know, to this day, we're just 7%. Black folks are just a 7% of the enrollment at Clemson. You know, the majority of misters, who are, who are misters who are now about 20 men at, at the university this year, and we haven't had that every year, are most of the uh, students of color in our, teacher in our undergraduate teacher education program. There are more men in, at Clemson at, in teacher ed than there are women. So how are they going to um, be prepared to do what we expect them to do? We do that through the co-curriculum, Andre. We do it through developing who they are. The young people address, you know, talked about uh, history and heritage and culture. You have to be able to understand your history, heritage, and, heritage and culture in order to connect with others who have that same history, heritage, and culture. I am convinced that the misters that we produce and everyone that have graduated in the last 15 years have, are still in the classroom. They're still working. They're still, they're still performing. They're still giving back. I am convinced that if you get, if, if D Dylan Roof, you know, the, the, the tragic um, uh, murderer of the uh, Emmanuel Nine had a mister in third grade, that he would not have been a shooter that night. I can stand here, sit here, and say to you that I know what we're producing with misters. If he had a, a, a mister for a third grade teacher, he would not have been the killer that night. Mm. The young lady in Spring Valley, there were black educators mm. that set her up. Spring Valley was in Columbia, South Carolina. I'm in a space, you know, that we're challenged every day. You know, that if those educators were truly educators, that yet that young lady wouldn't have been dragged up like an animal. A future mother, a future wife, a future grandmother treated like an animal for not giving up her cell phone. If they had had a mister as a leader in that school, it would not have happened because misters know how to misterize an environment by providing the kind of self esteem, this kind of, the kind of development and empowerment. We have an IEP in MISTER, not to be confused in special ed with an IEP. The MISTER IEP is individual empowerment plans. Mm. 
every minister has an individual empowerment plan when they start as a freshman right through to graduation that visualizes what their future is and what kind of teacher they're gonna be. When ministers graduate, they're ready to step into a classroom and be effective in any classroom, any setting, with any population in South Carolina. We don't teach ministers just to teach black children. We can put a minister in any classroom and they, can, they will be effective. While the Emanuel Nine, I'll close with this, while the Emanuel Nine were being murdered, the school district across the street, right just doors across the street, was being pro, you know, was, was a victim of, were, were being protested by the NAACP, you know, to engage in a, in a uh, because they were uh, protesting the appointment of the superintendent for, for the school district. Right at the same time, because the NAACP and others were, were not pleased with the appointment and the way in which the process went to appoint the superintendent of the Charleston County School District. You know, right at the same time when folks were grieving the Emanuel Nine, there is, there's, there's efforts, it's a day-to-day -day grind. What we're talking about here is not something that is a sound bite. It really is not something for a panel discussion. You know, this is a waste of time for me, to tell you the truth, because I expect to go back to South Carolina and be engaged in the day-to-day -day grind of mm. what it takes to prepare exactly. you know, young teachers. This is encouraging to see, and you know, the reason I do it is not because I'm asked, because there's so much talent in this room you know, that, that we need with the right kind of heart and head to really be, to, 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 to meet the need that is met. So although I'm glad that these young folks have options, I can, always, I can also agree with David Johns you know, we do assume that, we, that the best talent in our, in, our, in our communities need to look at not only to teach, but teach at the early child elementary level. Yeah. You know, at the lower levels to establish that foundation, especially for boys. By the time we get to middle school and high school, they're done. They're done. If we don't capture at a first, second, third, kindergarten, preschool, first, second, third grade, we're gonna lose them. So we'll misters are teaching at the elementary early child level. We've, 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 not, we've refused to, 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 to jump to the secondary level so quick. You know, they're at the early level. We get a black male, a Latino male in front of a classroom at the early, at early level, they can be effective and change, really change the face of education and change the culture of our systems. So let's get, we gotta get to some questions very quick. Let's get some rapid fire questions, we'll, and, we, and we may be able to get in more if you can be concise, ask an actual question, <laughs> <laughs> and then our panel can respond. So let's go. Ladies first. Ladies you're, first. You're ladies first. Everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. So I appreciate the piece about right now trying to get them in elementary, but right now for those who are in high school that we see that are losing their lives to gun violence in the neighborhoods, like what can we yep. do for those boys right now other than nurture them in the classroom? Because once they leave our doors, it's the streets. So what you do is each and every boy that you pass or even if you have a friend who has no job, tell that friend to get with a boy, a young man from your school, and tell him to take him just on a park so that he can see what other people see instead of seeing the, the cracked streets with flowers growing out of it. He needs to see something else. Change his, his view of everything. That's how I got where I'm at today. I had my view changed by so many different people. That's what needs to happen. young boys being taken for granted um, and their talents going to waste because they're following what people expect of them so as a community we need to expect the best from them often uh, one more thing yep. oftentimes we <laughs> stay woke. Stay we woke. we um, kind of make boys out to be 
I've seen African American boys particularly be created into something to be afraid of and to be, to, you, you don't want to nurture something that could hurt you and we often see young boys as monsters rather than men and that has to change. Right. And, I, and very quickly, I want the representative from um, um, uh, the, the White House and the Department of Ed to really respond to this discipline issue because I know since there's been a reduction over the last year since the, um, the uh, I'm forgetting the, the, the policy to reduce um, suspension and expulsion. Is that working? Are you seeing changes in behavior from that kind of, yes. so please. Yes, um, so the, the short version is something, something that folks can do here concretely um, is, to, is to use the resources that have been put out by the Department of Education and the Department of Justice to change the policies at your schools and at your districts. And the families and the parents and the communities will be with you on this. And there is actual material backed up by data and research that says things like zero tolerance policies, are the things that lead to disproportionate suspensions and expulsions, particularly of young males of color. And so basically, if you go to ed.gov slash school discipline, you can see a ton of information that you can use, that you can actually put into practice, that you can share with your principals, with your superintendents, with your school boards, um, and most importantly, I think, with your family organizations, with your community-based nonprofits, because then they can take that fight forward to reduce those numbers. Those do produce actual results. Yeah, and, and the one thing I'll add briefly, and David, I'm sure will add on, but the one thing also to mention is another way that you can seek to change policy from a practical, specific standpoint is looking if, to see if your community is part of the President's My Brother's Keeper Community Challenge, because that's something where almost 200 communities throughout the country, led by the mayor or the city executive, has rounded up the school system, business leaders, nonprofit leaders, faith leaders, et cetera, all of them pledging to find ways to improve outcomes for everyone, including boys and young men of color, and they are specifically trying to change policies, put in resources, and do practices. And that's how you can do something can you just today read, um, to help the let young people. people know how to get that resource? Yes, uh, the community challenge is at um, mbkchallenge.org. Is the, is the website, mbkchallenge.org. And then the school discipline is simply ed, as in education, ed.gov slash school discipline. And that's for information that you can use to help the young people that are in your communities today. Yeah, so three quick things to make that really meaningful as well are to one, leverage the data that exists. Um, the president launched the My Brother's Keeper initiative in part to highlight the data that we are no longer affected by. And so while now people talk about the fact that for every one non-minority male suspended or expelled, there are three boys and men of color who are sus suspended or expelled, we forget that that rate is six times as much for women and girls. And so there are also reports connected to the White House Council of Women and Girls, as well as produced by the NAACP LDF, that highlight the need for us to have conversations in the margins and honor and acknowledge intersectionality. Second is that we need to stop saying things that are not based in fact. For example, there are more black men in prison than in college. That is factually inaccurate. There are more than 600,000 black men on college campuses throughout this country. Stop clapping because the problem is that we are still disproportionately represented in prison because our babies as early as kindergarten are being pushed out of the very spaces where they need to feel safe and gather the tools, experiences, and credentials needed to be successful. And that's our fault. And so if we don't have classroom management skills or understand how to do the work that Azania talked about to reach our kids, then we need to stay woke and go back and do some more homework. Quick question, quick question. <clears throat> yeah, so I really love uh, talking about how we as a community need to expect more from our students. The school that I come from, I teach in Chicago. I think we do really well in expecting more. Yeah, Chicago. Um, but he, I think here's another root issue that I don't think we touched on yet. I think another root violence in my years there that I've learned in trying to find what the root cause of violence is, um, one is a lack of opportunity and lower expectations. However, I, some, of the, some of the best students that I have, they're some of the most loving uh, kids with big dreams. They want to be engineers, technicians. But the thing that still holds them back, the, the, the last barrier that they can't cross that still keeps them in the streets and still keeps them uh, thinking about violence is revenge. Mm. It, it, you know, I don't know if it's in other cities, but we have some called ops, right? So if you're in an opposite gang, how, how, can we as, how can we as a teachers or as a community at large help students cross that barrier? Because it's almost, they're like, Mr. Hong, I can't, no, I can't forgive him. He killed my mom or he killed So let's, let's talk about some best practices around conflict resolution and other things. Just quickly. 
Um, so to and I deal really want to hear. Um, oh, I'm sorry. In LA, I need LA to represent. To deal with some of the situations I've been through, um, to get over them, um, I count to ten. And if I'm still upset, uh, I close my eyes. And I think of all the people that have pushed me forward in life, and I, I ask myself, if you fail at what, they, what you wanted to do, what does that make you? Where does that leave you? That leaves me in the dust with everybody else who has stopped trying, who has stopped trying to push forward. So what I, I would advise you to grab that person, not roughly, but by the shoulder or by the collar, and whisper in their ear and say, what would your mother want you to do? What would your father want you to do? What would your brother or your sister or your cousin or your grandmother want you to do? I think what Remy's doing is making plain that we need to approach kids in the same way we want people to approach us, and that's with love. Right, so we host summits around the country. Uh, we call them AFAM Ed Summits. Uh, and much unlike this space, the only experts who get to sit on the stage are them. Right, and we ask them what's the one thing you need in order to feel safe, engaged, and supported. And no matter where we are, what their age, they say they need love. Right, what he's also talking about is having tools to be able to respond to the moments of conflict, and we all have them. We also all respond in very different ways, but that is a practical thing that we need to do is to impart in our students tools to respond to the things that affect them, right? We also have to be really clear that some of our babies experience things sometimes on the way to and from school. This happens in Chicago, I'm from Inglewood, happens in a lot of places where y'all live, right? That would break the average adult and we need to acknowledge it. One of the hardest things for me was going into Florissant after the Secretary of Education, Artie Duncan, went and talking to teachers who told their students don't talk about the fact that Mike Brown died. Forgetting that they were on social media having all types of conversations about it. Right? We forget that they live in a world where they are affected by things and have access to technology. To be able to engage in conversations, we need to insert ourselves into those spaces with love and to help them deal with life. Re um, I, I got to get ref yeah, yeah. in no, here just right. quickly. Right. And okay, go ahead. Go Three ahead. words. Three words for folks to look up. That's all I'm going to say. Look, look this up. Trauma-informed care. Absolutely. Look that up. Now, I actually need to bring up, introduce um, Mario... Benabe, Benabe, um, who will give some closing remarks. Mario. So many feelings going uh, throughout my body right now and so many emotions. Um, I want to talk about how education is a deeply personalized exercise and understand that it is, a, it is a healing process that comes with that. But what I'm conflicted by is the idea of schooling. Um, in most urban educational settings, what we see is not education, we see schooling. Um, we see a continued narrative of quote unquote normal learning in the most non-normative way. Um, I'm also um, conflicted by, and what keeps me up at night, is understanding that there are students who are alive but feel lifeless. In the process of schooling, what we see is the symbolic violence of extracting culture, of extracting language, um, and I'm gonna just throw this out there, extracting the hip hopness of some students, um, and also the vernacular forms of the way students speak within the classroom. But I will argue that as educators, we need to extract those systems that perpetuate the pipeline of violence um, that our students face every day. Um, and how do we do that? And I'm, I'm a firm believer in uh, restorative justice and building communal spaces. And the reason that I believe that those two things works is because it is a representation of the historical, cultural, and traditional values that us folks as Latinos and African Americans had way before the pre-colonial uh, histories that we, we that we had before we got into this country. We were practicing restorative justice in spaces using uh, 
uh, drumming, using some types of uh, circuit learning and circular motions. There's so many things that we have that are embedded within our culture that builds unconditional love. Hashtag stay woke. Hashtag stay woke. Um, and, you know, just to keep this short in the interest of time, the reason I feel that it is important to have educators of color, and particularly men, Latinos, um, and African American, is because there's a built sense of, of, of a dense connection. But the role of the educator within that framework of building those dense connections is structurally creating holes so that students, when they're in spaces in higher education um, with folks who don't look like them, they could still be able na to navigate through those, those, those systems that show them that they shouldn't be there in the first place. I think of Chief Justice Scalia in 2015 who spoke about uh, people of color shouldn't be in higher forms of education and that they should result to lesser institutions. And by him saying that, he's not only targeting the young people, he's targeting you as educators because he's making the statement that you are less, that we are less. And if you're gonna take that, then you shouldn't be doing this work. And what I say is that we are at war right now and look, just like Obama said, education is the biggest civil rights movement of our time. Thank you. So I want to thank a few people for making this happen. We um, definitely have to thank Stacy Cleveland. Stacy, please wave and say, this woman did a tre tremendous job. Patricia, Patricia is somewhere, I think Patricia's in here. Um, thank her, give, put some hands together for her. Marco, David, Roy, Ref, thank you. Um, Remy, Azania, um, and, and Mario, certainly. But I just wanted to briefly say, this is a very difficult question because immediately we pivot to, how can I stop that kid from hitting another kid or another teacher? And I don't think there's an easy answer to that. The things that we talked about are bigger, bolder, structural policy issues that take time. But if you do not stay, stay steadfast in providing a good curriculum, great instruction, um, doing the things that we know works, and we have to address the teacher diversity issue, but we need more quality teachers to do basic things over time, or these things will not change. In addition, you can do more than one thing. There are times that we have got to demand changes in the criminal justice system, the housing system, and all these other systems because we've been tricked into thinking that poverty doesn't matter, I can only stay laser-like focused on one area, and all these things. Eventually, we need to um, have a social justice ethic in our teaching because there are no easy solutions to violence. No one strategy, no quick fix. So when you leave here, what, what, what are some things you're gonna remember? What's the, the hashtag? Stay woke, right? But also, and remember there's, there's some resources, you got some hash, I mean, some from um, um, Twitter handles here. Tweet them, they're very responsive. Roy Jones is not as responsive, he told, but he, he's- added it. He's adding, <laughs> right, but keep the conversation going, but look for those opportunities <laughs> to really provide that social justice and interaction between these sectors when needed. So I just want to say thank you for coming. Keep the conversation going on Twitter and be well today and, and love the babies, teach the babies. <laughs>